The Z28 was born with one purpose, to win the Trans Am Championship. Today, over 30 years later, it's still winning. For muscle car fans, the mid-60s were a golden time. Propelled by the all-out racing competition between Detroit's automakers. Racing created a parade of cars that every year got faster, handled better, and delivered more pure driving pleasure. By the mid-60s, the car wars were being fought on every front. Buyers could choose from racy full-size cars, lightweight intermediates with massive engines, or the new wave of stylish sporty cars, led by the Mustang. Now, the Chevrolet Camaro came, or came about in response to the overwhelming success of the, of the Ford Mustang. Ford had a tremendous head start. By the time the first Camaro came out in 1967, Ford had already sold over a million Mustangs. So they had to play catch-up in a hurry. The Camaro rolled out at the beginning of the 1967 model year. Its styling was in keeping with the long hood, short deck pony car format. But unlike the Mustang, the Camaro was designed from day one to accommodate any engine in Chevrolet's inventory. This ability to wrap Chevy's largest engines in such a light package made the Camaro an instant muscle car. A buyer could walk into a Chevrolet dealer, order a Camaro, and then just get a tremendous variety of options. Everything from inline six cylinder engines all the way up to screaming big blocks to Z28s, uh, custom interiors. Basically, you name it, you could get it on a Camaro in the first generation. The Super Sport Camaros with the big block engines grabbed all the headlines in the auto press that year. But Chevrolet had something else in mind for the Camaro. Very quietly, in a move practically unnoticed by anyone but the sports car racers, Chevy announced an option to the basic Camaro, which offered a number of heavy-duty handling components. This package also included a new engine, the 290 horsepower 302 small block. The whole thing was called Special Performance Package Z28, and it was created for one purpose, to beat the Mustang on the racetrack. The Z28 was more race car than street car. The way it accelerated, cornered, and stopped made it the perfect car to go after the Mustang, which, at the moment, was the class of the field in the newly created Trans Am Racing Series. The Mustang had won the Trans Am Championship in 1966 without any real competition. In 1967, the all-new Z28 team of Roger Penske and Mark Donahue entered the fray and won three races. Mustang took the title again that year, but the Camaro team now knew how to play the game. During the next two seasons, as the Trans Am series became increasingly popular, the Z28 blew everyone else away. Chevy's little factory race car dominated the series holding off a huge effort from second place four, and full assaults from Dodge, Plymouth, and American Motors. Meanwhile, out on the streets, the Z28 had been discovered. Muscle car fans were delighted to find a Camaro that sold for slightly more than an SS350, ran the quarter mile within two tenths of an SS396, and went around corners like a Corvette. It's a pretty neat little car in, the, in an era where bigger and bigger blocks were you know the norm it was a uh, kind of a throwback a real sophisticated little small block that, that ran real high today more than 30 years later the z28 is still a great ride whether it's on the racetrack or the street the z28 gives its drivers the thrill of all-out performance every time they slide in behind the wheel we'll take you on one of those rides when the american muscle car returns For a while, it looked like Chevrolet was going to ignore the pony car phenomenon. 
Chevrolet already made America's best-loved sports car, the Corvette. They also had a sporty little compact car, the Chevy 2 Nova, that ran like a jackrabbit when equipped with a high-performance 327. They even had an engineering breakthrough car, the Corvair, which in Monza's fighter trim was as sporty as anything from Europe. All these models, in addition to the Super Sport Impalas and Chevelles, the darlings of the muscle car crowd, made Chevrolet's lineup pretty full. Start with the new Mustang 2 Plus 2 Fastback. But the pony car thing was here, whether Chevy wanted to play or not. So within six months of the Mustang's introduction, Chevy got busy. Their design centered around a one-piece unitized body with a separate front subframe which allowed the engineers to optimize the car's front suspension. And since this front subframe cradled the engine, it was designed so that anything from the 155 horsepower six-cylinder engine to the mighty 450 horsepower 427 could be interchanged, a fact that was immediately apparent to street riders and racers everywhere. The most... Uh noticeable styling elements like the spoilers and the cowl induction hood and things of that nature were actually developed by Chevrolet Engineering for use on the racetrack. So this is actually a case where the spoilers and the scoops and all those things uh, really come from hardcore engineering to make the cars perform better. With all the hoopla surrounding the car's debut, including being chosen as the pace car for the 1967 Indy 500, the Camaro was a high visibility item. Still, though, the Mustang was outselling all other pony cars combined. And some people at Chevrolet were convinced that this Trans Am racing thing had something to do with it. So, within two months of the Camaro's introduction, Chevy's engineers were hard at work making the Camaro not just legal, but competitive in Trans Am racing. Unfortunately, GM's brass frowned upon any kind of factory racing involvement. So, building a factory race car was, to say the least, politically incorrect. General Motors, as a company, was not actively involved in racing. Therefore, uh, all the development work that took place on these cars, and it was a tremendous amount of development work done, uh, was somewhat clandestine. But make no mistake, uh, the idea here was to build as fast a car as possible and outrun Ford on the racetrack. The centerpiece of the Z28 option was the all-new 302 small block. The 302's bore and stroke of 4 inches by 3 inches meant this little engine would be a screamer. Into it, Chevy poured TRW 11 to 1 pistons, forged rods, a 485 lift solid camshaft, bigger push rods, a Holley 780 on an aluminum intake manifold, and the Corvette cylinder heads with 202 intake valves. The advertised horsepower was 290 at 5,800 RPMs. The 302 engine was actually rated at 290 horsepower by Chevrolet. By the time you put headers on it, open exhaust, uh, the over-the-counter camshaft, some of the other pieces would actually make uh, 450, 460 horsepower. All these trick high performance parts were available for a package price of $358. There was another $400 in mandatory options that a buyer had to check off, such as the Muncie M21 close ratio four-speed trans, quick ratio steering, and power disc brakes. But still, the Z28's bargain basement price was the deal of the century. The first Zs went into production in December 1966. And by the end of 1967, they had made 602 of the little jewels. Out on the track, the Camaro team of Roger Penske and Mark Donahue won three races and were very quietly becoming Trans Am's super team. In 1968, Penske, Donahue, and the Camaro would own Trans Am racing. Stay with us as the Camaro takes the gloves off on the American muscle car. Chevrolet was delighted with the Camaro's first year sales. Over 200,000 Camaros went home in the hands of lucky buyers in 1967, 
making it one of Chevrolet's most successful new car introductions ever. So rather than reinvent a pretty nice wheel, Chevy merely corrected some handling problems that 67 owners complained about and made the usual minor trim changes on the 68 models. One of the few shortcomings of the 67 Camaro were its single leaf rear springs. So for 68, Chevy replaced these with much stiffer multi-leaf units. And it staggered the rear shocks to help control axle hop on acceleration. After the strong showing the Penske Camaro had made in 67, the Z28 was starting to get some good press. People were starting to talk about this little Camaro in terms once reserved for the Corvette. Chevy decided to make the Z28 a little more dressy in 68. Z28 identification badges were added and front and rear spoilers became available this year. A huge favorite with the street crowd, the Z's front to rear racing stripes were also continued in 68. Again in 68, the screaming little 302 engine was the piece that made it all work. The SCCA changed the rules in 1968 to allow multiple carburation. In response, Chevrolet designed this 1968 cross ram two four barrel intake manifold. It's more commonly seen on 69 models, but it was indeed uh, available on 68s over the counter. Now, with some seat time in the Z28, Mark Donahue and the Penske team began feeding information back to Chevy Engineering on ways to improve the car. Stronger spindles and a larger front sway bar were developed. And in a move designed to help the racers, Chevy now offered optional four-wheel disc brakes, which gave the Z28 braking performance equal to the Corvette. One of the SCCA rules uh, mandated that everything that was on the race car had to be available to the general public. Now, to a street guy, that was great. Uh, all the camshaft design, all the exhaust uh, design, all the special parts generated for the Z28 program were as close as your local Chevrolet parts dealer. From the first green flag of the 68 racing season, the Penske team took no prisoners. They ran away with the series championship winning 10 out of 12 races and winning eight of these in a row. Back in the corporate office tower, the GM executives applauded their little factory racer, despite their no racing official policy. Also in 68, a Z28 won the NHRA Superstock Championship in a final race between, you guessed it, two Z28s. After such a fantastic year, you'd think that Chevy would relax and rest on their laurels. But that's not how they play the game at Chevrolet. Stay with us as the Z28 roars into 1969, its best year ever, when we return on the American Muscle Car. From 602 Z28 sold in 1967 to 4,199 sold in 1968. And now, Chevrolet Division General Manager Pete Estes predicted Chevy would sell over 25,000 Z28s in 1969. The actual figure would be closer to 20,000 by year end. But this optimism clearly indicates how much this little car had endeared itself to Chevy's management in just two years. And why not? The Camaro was clearly one of the most popular cars Chevrolet had ever built. And the Z28 was the most exciting Camaro. At least according to people who had driven one. In its first two years, the Z had outperformed Chevy's most optimistic sales forecasts, wiped the Trans Am tracks clean of Ford products, and had even cleaned up on the drag strips. So, now what? Well, if you're Chevrolet in the late 60s, the only answer to that question is, now we improve it. Chevy's first facelift to the Camaro was a subtle work of art. From the fender lips, to the sharper nose, to the restyled rear quarters, it was enough of a makeover to keep Camaro fresh and exciting in its third year. The car was two inches longer, 
and an inch and a half wider this year, and it wore it well. There were now three Z28 option packages. They ranged in price from $506, which included the front and rear spoilers, to $758, which added dealer-installed exhaust headers, to $959, which added the cross-ram induction setup to the other options. When combined with the other popular Camaro options, such as power steering, brakes, radio, and trim and interior groups, a Z28 could easily cost over $5,000, making it one of the most expensive Camaros you could buy. Under the hood, very little changed this year. In fact, there wasn't much left to add except hardcore racing parts. There was a new Go Real Fast solid lifter camshaft, which provided 493 lift on the intake side and 512 on the exhaust, and a new engine oil cooler. All Z28 engine blocks now had four bolt main bearings and thicker main webs. Another thing that you'll notice on this car is the ZL2 ducted hood, which everyone calls the cowl induction these days. Uh, but it, uh, it was RPO ZL2. Uh, mates up to the air cleaner right here with that rubber seal when you shut the hood the the uh, seal seals the air cleaner to the hood and of course the engine gets to breathe fresh air from the back of the hood going into its third year of Trans Am competition the Z28 was the tough kid in the playground but Ford was seething over its loss of the Trans Am manufacturers championship and they were planning a little ambush to regain their dominance in Trans Am racing, the Boss 302 Mustang was built according to the Z28's formula. Ford loaded this new car down with every factory high performance part in the catalog, then put together a blue chip racing team. Ford's team was fielded by longtime NASCAR team owner Bud Moore, and his two Boss Mustangs were driven by George Fulmer and the legendary Parnelli Jones. Trans Am Racing was due for some fireworks as the Penske Donahue team squared off against Bud Moore and Parnelli. Stay with us as we go to the races on the American Muscle Car. In its five-year history, the Trans Am series had changed from its silk scarf weekend racer beginnings into a bare knuckles brawl between corporate giants. The 1969 season was going to be the shootout at the OK Corral between Ford and Chevrolet. Both the Penske Camaro team and the Bud Moore Mustang team had done everything possible to give themselves an edge, but the cars were still practically identical in performance. We're the first one to come out, you know, with, uh, with the lug nuts fastened to the wheel. I know we'll forget we're on the pit stop, Roger Penske sitting back way over somewhere with a pair of binoculars trying to see how we were putting them wheel and tires on, making about a 25 second stop for four tires back then and taking them a minute and a half and two minutes, you know. I never will forget that. When the final checkered flag fell, the Penske Z28 had captured the championship again, winning by a narrow margin over Parnelli Jones and the Boss 302 Mustang. They had the best circuit in the world going with the top drivers all over the world. And uh, Penske and them, they, they Penske tore them up bad with the Camaro. The 69 Z28 occupies a special place in American automotive history. It would take a truly spectacular car to replace it in Chevy's lineup. And as you might expect, that's just what Chevy had waiting in the wings. Once again, Chevrolet had created a milestone automobile. Tony Rowe is a Camaro restorer who prefers the second generation Camaro's body style. Second generation is my favorite. I, by far, I think they're the best body style, the best design, uh, the best body contours, the interior roominess. Uh, it's much more than your third generation, your fourth generation, your first generation. I like them, but overall, your second generation to me is the, is the more finer Camaro that General Motors produced, the early second generation car from 70 to 73. 
Even though the new 350 cubic inch LT1 small block was rated at 70 horsepower more than the 302, the Z28 didn't repeat its Trans Am championship this year. With the Penske Donahue Super Team now fielding AMC Javelins, there was no more backing from Chevrolet as in years past. Parnelli Jones and George Fulmer cruised to an easy Trans Am title for Ford in 1970. As the 70s progressed into the era of unleaded gas, one after another, the supercars from the muscle era dropped off the automotive radar screen. Your Holly 780 went by the wayside in 72, and your horsepower rating was 245 for that year, which was a dramatic decrease in, from the years of 1970, 71. 72 was a car rated at 255 horsepower, but the components that were inside the engine and the drivetrain were all still good quality parts. Positive traction rear ends, turbo 400s for your automatic cars, four bolt main engines, forged steel rods, forged steel cranks, forged aluminum flat top pistons. On a few occasions, the Z's future looked doubtful, but there have always been enough dedicated, loyal, and very vocal car buyers who insisted that America wouldn't be as much fun without the Z28. Thankfully, Chevrolet agreed and kept the Z28 alive through several designs. Each Z28 was a car for its times, and each one was a cut above the ordinary, like they always have been. So the Z28 lives today in much the same form as it did in its early years. It's still powered by Chevrolet's most potent small block engine. It still corners like a slot car and it can still blow the doors off anything that dares pull up next to it. And at age 30 plus, we should all be so lucky. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again on the American Muscle Car. And remember, don't crush them, restore them.